Growing up in Kellogg, I remember um, playing in the park. I remember skiing in the mountains. I remember um, going to school, which I loved. And I remember all the people who were around. The miners went by our house in the morning. They came by our house in the afternoon. We could hear the mine whistles blow. We could see the lights of the rock house where the ore came in. But we weren't very much involved with the mine. We saw all these people, but we didn't, I don't think any of us realized what was going on underneath us. So it was just kind of like a normal childhood. The history of Kellogg began with the jackass. Noah Kellogg uh, was a miner, a prospector, who came here from um, mines farther up the valley. And with his jackass, he was exploring around the hills right back up this way. Uh, and supposedly the jackass kicked over a big piece of galena ore, which is what silver is in. And um, that started the rush here. But mostly you find those minerals underground. You often find gold closer to the top, which was one of the first uh, rushes to this area. But when they found the silver, uh, that's when Kellogg started. It was about the 1880s. A mining town looks very different from a town in the Midwest. In this town, we had a smelter, so it was constantly pumping out smelter smoke. And we had tall smokestacks that would pump it out day and night. And towards the end of the time the mine was still going, they did a smokestack that was 750 feet high to push the poisons higher up so it would get in the wind and go someplace else. A smelter is where you take the ores and smelt them down, that is, put them in big vats of boiling um, chemicals, and then you would get silver, lead, and zinc. And lead was a predominant metal, but with lead you often had silver and zinc. All those were products from this mine. Here in this valley, um, the boom lasted a hundred years. It went from the 1880s to the 1980s when the mine was closed down. The mine was almost the sole employer except for retail stores. Um, everybody depended on the mine. Because everybody depended on the mine, the mine affected everybody's lives. The taxes from the Bunker Hill, which was the name of the mine, supported the schools, supported the library, um, paid for our uniforms in the marching band, and uh, employed students in the summer, and then provided scholarships, thousands of scholarships, for the kids who came out of here. The effect on the town of the mine closing was devastating. The town had been through lots of hard times. There had been labor strikes, and I write about uh, one of the big strikes in my book. And it had been through the Depression, when all the men voted to work just three days a week so everybody could work. But when the mine closed down, nobody could believe it. And it, every, they tried to get people to come in and be a white knight to save the town and somebody else buy it. Um, a, a company called Gulf Resources had bought it from the original owners and they were mining deep and mining fast and getting the best stuff out and then the Environmental Protection Agency came in and said you can't keep doing what you're doing. And between the way the Gulf Resources managed the mine and the EPA, they closed it down and this became a Superfund site. The Environmental Protection Agency is the one who tries to keep the air clean and the water clean. And this town did not have clean air or clean water. And so there were lots of poisons that were spread out on the ground. While this one company was managing the mine, there was a bag house fire. The bag house was the place where many of the poisons were taken out of the, the um, processing before it went up in the air. And they kept running the mine and the smelter even though the bag house had burned. And that was, a, I think, approximately 1972, maybe 1974. And the town didn't know that, and so the, there was lots of lead and arsenic and other toxic chemicals that were spread out. So when the EPA came in and said, this has to be cleaned up, the river has to be cleaned up, we did call it Lead Creek, and, uh, and they just closed everything down and the company who was managing it had already said they couldn't run it anymore because it was too expensive to comply with the regulations. It became a 21 square mile Superfund site and 
everything was closed down. There were fences around everything saying no trespassing. If you come into this property, you'll be poisoned. The lakes in the area had signs, don't swim in here, don't eat the fish. Um, it, it was, it really did end the town as a mining town. There were government monies spent, about 220 million by the time I wrote my book, which was in the 1990s, uh, when I was first doing interviews. Now I guess it's up to about 440 million, cleaning up the area. They dug out every yard, put in clean dirt. They worked on the river, moved the river, dredged it, moved it back. They took out the field in the football, football stadium and put clean dirt in. And, and so basically the town is pretty clean now. Many people in the town felt that was not appropriate, that we'd all lived here. There was nothing wrong with any of us, with a few exceptions. And it just, it just was the end of a, an era. A lot of people stayed and waited and waited and waited for the mines to reopen, but they didn't. Uh, at some of them, there was still mining going on up the valley, not, not the smelting. They would ship it out in ore cars probably to, there was a smelter in Washington and there were some in Canada. So some of them could get work there, but most of them just waited and waited for the mines to reopen, and, and they didn't. And finally many left, but many stayed, and maybe they're involved with the, the ski industry here and the, the tourist industry, but the wages paid in those industries are so much less than the miners were paid. It, it really hurt the town a lot. I wanted to write a book about Kellogg because I grew up here, and I. I began it as a novel about the labor strike that happened when I was a junior and senior in high school. And so I came back to interview people about this strike and find out more about it because I knew a lot about it because I'd worked for the lawyer who helped form the new union. And, um, but I learned that I didn't know everything. And the more I talked with people, the more I learned. And it just seemed I should be trying to preserve the stories of the people who lived here because uh, the mining was gone by then, and uh, there were such, um, it was such a community where everybody really helped each other, and through the hard times and through the good times, and it seemed to me it ought to be remembered somehow, and so I decided to put this book together.